Good morning and welcome to WCAT Radio and TV. I'm Kiki Latimer and I'm your host for the Catholic Bookworm. And this morning I'd like to welcome a uh, new author, Glenn Morrow, uh, for what I'm hoping will be another delightful interview. So, hi, Glenn. Thank you for being with us this morning. Hi. I am glad to be here. How about you start us off with a short prayer? Okay. It's on track. All right. Uh, Dear Lord, um, our intention here today is to say things that will support and sustain um, the listeners and the readers. And um, um, please aid us to uh, to say things and that do that. Um, In Jesus name, um, bless our time together. Amen. 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 Thank you. Mm-hmm. So I do not, ha- I've read the book, but I have read it only online um, as a PDF copy, but you have a copy in hand, correct? I do and do it. I have yeah. several copies in hand. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The Things book. Beloved. Things Beloved by Glenn Morrow. Yes. Looks beautiful. And we'll talk about the cover um, more mm-hmm. towards the end. Mm-hmm. But, uh, so um, you've been writing for a while. You've written yes. fiction for quite a long time. Uh, Glenn and I have known each other for many years. We met in the storytelling community. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself to get okay. us started? Okay. Well, I've been doing um, creative fiction my entire adult life. And uh, um, the, pro- the journey has been to go from what is clever and witty and um, way too smart to from the head, moving it down to the heart. And storytelling was part of that journey because it was spontaneous and it was about, about uh, feelings and not about, um, not about um, cleverly constructed uh, fictions. And um, that's been the course of my journey really. And I feel like these stories are a culmination of it um, in many ways, that these are stories of the heart and of the spirit and not, uh, there is plenty of wit in them and there's a lot, of, a lot of smart stuff, but the smart stuff hopefully is all in service to, uh, to um, true, true statements about, uh, about humanity and about love and compassion, sacrifice. Um, caring and and, uh, and nurturing each other. Well, it's interesting because um, it's interesting. The book is titled Things Beloved. Um, right. And it's certainly um, both stories. There's two stories in the book, The Observatory and The Better Boat. Mm-hmm. Um, and they both um, revolve around things. Uh, the thing of a painting in the first and the, the sailboat sailboat right it's a sailboat i'm not a boat person (laughs) there are actually three three things beloved in these stories there is a wooden sailboat that a 12 year old boy falls in love with there is a uh, college telescope observatory which is sort of a touchdown touchstone for um, college alumni who come back 25 years later um, and have enormous nostalgia for the place and there's an abstract painting. And all of these things are in instances of love between people, love between friends, love between married couples. Um, and the attachment to the thing is questioned, it's tested, and sometimes it has to be relinquished. But the love between the people in these stories is never broken or relinquished. Mm-hmm. And that's that's what these stories in many ways are about. Um, and the things become carriers of, of the affection between people. Um, and uh, those bonds um, are, are questioned. Um, As the- Catholics, you know, we have, a, we have a theology of, I call it the theology of stuff. We love mm-hmm. stuff. 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, John Paul II's theology of the body was about our stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yes. um, certainly, you know, as you travel through the cathedrals of Rome and you see the, rel the relics um, of the saints and the relics, you know, everywhere, um, you realize the importance of stuff in our lives. Uh, right. And we get attached to stuff. It becomes an yeah. extension of ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. And certainly like with our homes, we become aware of how much our stuff is an extension um, of ourselves. And it can be painful to lose it, the things. I mean, there's nothing like getting rid of your old car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, oh, well. it's such a painful thing. It's so ridiculous. But we're, you know, it, it's an extension of who we are for years. And then all of a sudden, it, you know, it falls apart and it's time to get a new car. And we're heartbroken. To say goodbye to the old jalopy, you know, because we love it. It's our stuff. Right. Um, well, one of the statements in The Better Boat is, is there any inanimate object in the world that is more beloved than a wooden sailboat? And if you talk to sailors, they, they attribute personalities to them. They, they, uh, they are absolutely in love with their sailboats. They spend enormous amount of time um, taking care of them and talk about their quirks and, their, and, uh, and all of that. Um, and most importantly, we name them. They're yes, named. we do. We do. You know? uh, naming of sailboats is, is one of the things that's uh, talked about in the book, right? Right at the beginning, um, um, Anthony, who is uh, the 12 year old boy who gets the sailboat for a dollar, um, is asked by his friend Francis, um, um, its name is Aurora. That's a dumb name. Why don't we give it a name like Vengeance or Black Death, something with pirates in it? And um, Anthony responds, you can't change the name of a, of a boat. And uh, that's her name. And uh, so, so the naming of, of things, of course, is important, especially sailboats. Um, yeah, our naming is important. I mean, that's our, you know, the big thing at baptism. We are called by name. Yes, right. So we have that, right. Uh, you know, and as soon as we get a pet, we name it. You know, that's the big right. thing. What's the same? You right. know, we have to, to bring something into the family. We name it. Right. One of the, one of the Catholic jokes in, uh, in the better boat, these are 12-year-olds who are cradle Catholics. And one of the jokes that Francis and, and, Anthony uh, are talking about is what happens if you pick a really rotten saint's name and you're stuck with it? You're stuck say, well, with you know, he says it's, it's a lifetime journey. Maybe someday you're going to find out something really cool about that saint. Um, right, right. Yeah. My grandson, Jonathan, he has, since he was old enough to walk, he's been in love with shoes. He's now 15, but he, he loves shoes. We used to sit in the front row of church and his favorite time of mass when he was little was when people came up for the Eucharist and they walked past him and he could inspect everyone's shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and when last year, when it came time for confirmation, um, he chose St. Crispin, uh, mm -hmm. who was the patron saint of cobblers shoe and shoes. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> so the, the names are important. We were, we were quite impressed that he chose St. Crispin. Right. In terms of these stories, the... Uh, the names of the stories are important. The first one is the observatory, which you can take as a literal statement. This is about an astronomical observatory, a big concrete dome with a telescope in it. Um, but the whole uh, thing is about seeing and observing. And uh, it, it shows up in many, many aspects of the story. Um, it is about the observatory. Um, yeah. And the other one, the better boat, um, is uh, the the better takes uh, takes on many many different uh, aspects as we go through this story. Um, some of them literal, and some of them more more um, moral or, or philosophical. Um, so in the observatory, these these well, they're sort of young people compared to us. They're still young people. In the story, um, they've come together what twenty five years later. That's correct. Um, there are five, five former uh, students of optical astronomy at a small college um, uh, somewhere in the West. Um, and they all graduated with degrees in optical astronomy. None of them became astronomers. Um, and, uh, 
and they went their separate ways. And 25 years later, they called back because the uh, college is selling off the astronomy observatory and they feel that this is, this is a terrible thing and they need to do something, at least commemorate it. So they all come back and there's, the narrator is Josh, who is a photographer um, back when, photogra when there was photography. And when everything went digital, he, uh, he became a photo enhancer and he now has a very nice business um, changing the appearance of, of fashion models. Um, he says there's one model whose collarbones have been completely removing for years. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so he's a little bit lost in a way. Um, his best friend is Kirk, who is a former NFL football player who uh, describes himself as all pro semi-famous um, and who is uh, uh, kind of the natural leader of the group. Um, he's a middle linebacker, and that's, that's the job of a middle linebacker, to be a leader. Um, and uh, then there's Raj, who's, uh, whose family wanted him to be an engineer or something, and he went into astronomy, and they all felt that it was a useless degree until he told them that this is the only major I can take that will give me unrestricted, uh, um, unrestricted access to a mainframe computer. And uh, turned out the mainframe computer is a PDP-11, which is a ancient piece of, uh, of technology that is basically only used now by MIT to run its model trains. Um, but for, uh, for Raj, it was an excuse uh, to, uh, to be an astronomy major. And when he graduated, he, uh, he became a uh, entrepreneur um, in the field of 3D printing and became very successful. Um, and then you've got- so they want to save this observatory. And in yes. a sense, they kind of come together and kind of make a deal with the devil. They do indeed. <laughs> there, is, there, is, there is a character named Milken, who is a Wall Street type. And um, he, is, uh, he appears when they're all in the, in the dome, you know, looking through the telescope and just, enjoying the nostalgia and wondering what they're going to do. And he appears and it turns out he has already bought the observatory and his plan is to bulldoze the whole thing. And, uh, and they uh, have to outsmart him. <laughs> well, it, in a way, yes, but it's, it's more complicated than that. It uh, is. I don't, want to, I don't want to give away too much. No, I'm not going to give away too much on this. There's, there, there's some very strange twists and turns to this plot. Um, uh, unexpected. Uh, they're not strange, but they are unexpected. Anyway, uh, Milton makes a deal with them, um, and if they they follow through with the deal, they'll he'll give the observatory back to the college. Um, and uh, and the way that they ultimately outsmart the devil. By the way, this is a story that I wrote. Um, as with Milken just being this kind of crass financier. Um, and it was only until after I finished the entire story and was doing revisions that I suddenly realized Milken isn't just a Wall Street financier with a cynical worldview. He is the devil. Um, and I did not write it that way. I was, you know, I was um, uh, guided by this. You know, I, these stories... I, in some ways, I didn't write. They wanted to be written. And, you know, God used me to, to write these stories. That's a little grandiose, but um, they started yeah, I think that. anyone who writes knows exactly, anyone who creates anything, I think, knows exactly what you mean. Right. Um, right. We feel that creative energy come through us. Um, we are open to it. You know, right. we cooperate with grace, as we say. Right. Um, but it's something we, we cooperate with, but um, yeah, yeah that, that inspiration. I had, a, I had a situation years ago where I, I sent, um, I, I had decided that after the earthquake in Haiti that, um, you know, after about six months, I said, well, somebody's gonna write a children's story about this disaster, it might as well be me. Um, and so I spent three months working painstakingly on a, on a story um, and sent it to my publisher, um, 
take care of Educavision at the time. And he basically wrote back in 24 hours and said, um, I hate the story. It's horrible. It's uninspiring. Mm -hmm. um, yes. But try again. Right. And I was mortified. I was embarrassed. Um, I sort of crawled into bed, you know, like the dog with the tail between my legs. I was like miserable because I didn't have another story. That was my earthquake story. Okay. Um, and yeah. as I was falling asleep, I dreamt a different story. Oh, good. Uh, there was a storyteller coming into the storytelling, into the earthquake camps. And he was saying to the children, tell me your story. Mm -hmm. um, and I woke myself up out of sleep and said, I've got to remember this dream in the morning. And in the morning, I wrote it down. A week later, the ending came and I sent it to my publisher and he loved it. Mm -hmm. um, yep. But I knew I hadn't written it. Right. <laughs> yes. These, these stories, you know, they, they started out with just an image and I had no idea where they were going and my initial ideas of where they were going got completely overturned and something much better came in. You know, the observatory was a college reunion and these five old, old college uh, friends would get together and we can kind of see where that would go. You know, all the old resentments and all the old issues and all the buried romances, none of that made it into the story. All of that was pushed aside. And it turns out that the, these five um, really care for each other. And their caring is what sustains them through the story. And they find new connections with each other and new ways uh, to, to be with each other. Um, Raj and Kirk, the football player and the, uh, and the 3D printer entrepreneur, um, who had nothing in common when they were in college, um, suddenly become um, the best of, of friends and, and help each other um, in surprising ways. Um, so um, the Better Boat started um, because um, my wife's father, who was a lifelong sailor, he started sailing when he was um, as young as Anthony, 12, um, had just died. And she had a lot of, she was feeling a lot of grief. And so I wrote a little passage about a 12 year old sailor um, to give her some solace. And she loved it and she was moved by it. And she said, keep writing. And so I kept writing. And uh, the next thing you know, um, Anthony's wandering along the beach and there's a guy kicking a sailboat high up on the dunes. And he sits and he watches this man, and this man takes his construction boots and slams into the sailboat. And he's kicking it and he's kicking it. And eventually Anthony says, why are you doing this? And it turns out that he can't, the, the town wants him to move the sailboat, but is giving him no options to move it. So he's trying to bust it into pieces so he can carry it away. And uh, he says, kid, if you want it, I'll sell it to you for a dollar. And so Anthony gets the sailboat, um, and uh, and the story, the story spins out from there. And Anthony knows nothing about sailing, and he makes all kinds of of mistakes. And uh, um, lo and behold, his his uh, his cousin Teresa from uh, from the Midwest shows up, and he wants to show off his sailboat, and she. Uh, she sits there and listens to him talk about all the wonderful things he's done in his sailboat. And, and then she says, you have no idea at all what you're talking about. <laughs> of course, absolutely <laughs> outraged her by character. this. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and it turns out that she is, you know, she is absolutely right that he's, he's, been, he's been just sailing by the seat of his pants and knows nothing really about it. And uh, it, um, it turns into um, him wanting to, uh, to kind of get even with her by, by learning this stuff. Um, He's not too happy about the idea of learning from a girl at first. <laughs> no, of course not, of course not. You know. I have seminarians that are sometimes like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they, they eventually become friends and, uh, and uh, 
their, uh, their pen pal relationship when she goes back to the Midwest is, uh, is the basis for, for the development of, of the second half of the book. Um, second half of the book, uh, of the story takes a decidedly unexpected turn, um, which involves um, um, Hurricane Carol of 1954 um, and, uh, and loss and grief. Um, and uh, I'm not going to say more than that, but, uh, but it's... Uh, I thought both, both stories would be interesting for young people, but especially The Better Boat. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would consider both stories appropriate for, for teens yes. to read, but The Better Boat, I think they would really, really enjoy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with you that there's a lot, you know, certainly the first half of it is all about being 12, being on coastal Rhode Island and loving sailing and, you know, having all of those kid relationships and uh, kid jokes and such, um, you know, and, uh, and uh, the, uh, the things that kids do, you know, um, like throwing a rock into a, into a lobster pot and, and yelling out rock lobster um, or, uh, or, talking about ghost, uh, ghost stories where the, the, the drowned fishermen come aboard the, the, uh, the fishing boat and fish alongside the living ones and scare the bejesus out of them. <laughs> um, you know, so there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of kid, kid lore and kid life in, in it. Um, the second half of it, I think, raises moral issues and uh, that a kid would not necessarily um, be able to fathom because it, it involves sacrifice. It involves um, making choices um, to, tr to try to heal up um, the world. And, uh, and that's, that's something that I think you need a more mature perspective to, to fully understand. Um, but it could be read on their level. Yes, yes, it definitely could. And start to plant a seed. You've yes. talked about the concept of, of referring to these as moral fiction. Yes. Um, and I guess, I mean, someone might ask the question, why is it, you know, not necessarily better, but why is it good to read fiction as opposed to just read a true story? It's plenty mm -hmm. of true stories out there. What, right. what is contained? What are the possibilities that fiction um, give us? Well, fiction is not a transcript. It's a template. There's a big difference. A fiction is a contained universe that has some connection to the universe, the messy universe in which we live, <laughs> and gives us some kind of hopefully, if it's if it's moral fiction, if it's good fiction, gives us some guidance and some hope um, for for understanding our own lives and how to how to live our lives with with grace and. Uh, and with kindness, and um, and so um, we don't. I don't look for fi to fiction to to be an exact replica of of the world we live in, and I don't look to fiction that uh, that presents all of the things that we we have to deal with, um, and in all their and all their ugliness. I'm not writing about my rotten childhood or <laughs> about addiction or abuse or, or um, you know, I'm writing about friendships that sustain. I'm writing about marriages that are strong. Um, I'm, I'm writing about uh, being tried, being, uh, being tempted by the devil um, and coming around um, and making it, making it home making it home. Um, it's food for the journey. I, I found that, I found both stories very inspiring um, mm -hmm. and I highly recommend them. Um, one of the things I liked was that your characters were, were kind of just sort of clean and straightforward. You didn't give them a lot of baggage. I mean, um, their lives, it wasn't a perfect world. In fact, they were trying to overcome obstacles in an imperfect mm -hmm. world. Um, right. But you didn't weigh your characters down with, with too much baggage. Um, like you're saying, they, um, they were kind of free to act mm -hmm. rightly or wrongly um, mm -hmm. with some kind of logic and thought. 
um, along with the heart. Right. You know, I, found that, I found that refreshing. Good. Good. You know, I, it, I, these are not sentimental stories, at least I hope not. Okay. Um, you know, nor are they unrealistic stories. There's, there's no magic in them. There's no, you know, there's no uh, DSX machine eye coming in and, and making everything good. Um, and the endings don't resolve. Evil is still out there, you know, because that's the real world. The endings resolve morally. We, we come home. We, we, ca we carry what is, what is most precious to us through, and it is not lost. But right. that doesn't mean that everything, everything resolves. Um, um, and uh, the way we defeat the devil to go back to the observatory is not by outwitting him. You can't outwit the devil. Um, you use the one thing that he, he doesn't know how to, to understand or use, and that's love. And if you look at the, uh, if you look at the way that, uh, that Josh ends up defeating the devil, it's not because he's, he's done something more clever, although it is something clever that he does, but the reason he does that clever thing is purely out of love. And uh, that's, what, that's what baffles the devil. And the devil, of course, is filled with pride, and he thinks he's got it all figured out. So, uh, so you know, he kind of trips over his own pride because he doesn't, the one thing he can't figure out is that Josh would do something um, out of love. <laughs> that, that, that scene, which I will not discuss, but, oh, I just love that final scene. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's it's really really um, surprising right. and delightful. And, right. Uh, well, and very exciting. The devil's, you know, Milken <laughs> says to says to Josh, Josh, do you play poker? And Josh says, Yeah, I do. And the devil says, Don't. <laughs> As in, I've got you all figured out. Uh, now I know you know neither story is an allegory, but I know um, I know you're a great lover of Dante and the yes. Divine Comedy. Mm -hmm. um, yes. How would you say that background is sort of woven in here? Well, in the the Observatory, of course, is about astronomy. It's about the universe, and uh, the, the Divine Comedy is structured. Um, certainly, the heavens are structured in in Paradiso on a physical description of the universe. It's a, you know, it's, it's the Ptolemaic universe, it's not the one we're living in. Um, but, uh, so there's that. And all three of the books of, uh, of the Divine Comedy, the last word in them is stele, the stars. And, uh, and the last word in the observatory is stars. And, uh, and uh, when Don, the first thing that Dante notices when he enters the gates of hell is that he can't see the stars. Hmm. And uh, so uh, the stars as, as divine guidance, as, as something outside of us and beyond us and something we did not create and that, uh, that endlessly fascinate us and endlessly guide our course. Um, are, are essential to, to the Divine Comedy, and, uh, and they figure in the, in, uh, in the observatory. Um, um, when we turn to the devil in the observatory, he's the great negation. He is the, he is the, the one who, who hates the universe, hates astronomy, hates curiosity, hates art. He says, the one thing I appreciate, appreciate about art is that it appreciates. Um, you know, his only measure for anything is money and, and the power that money gives him. His 30 um, pieces of silver. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, what, what better image of the devil himself than somebody who hates the universe? It's mm -hmm. God's creation. And the stars. Know? I mean, we yeah. all just, I mm -hmm. don't know anyone who doesn't love the stars, right. you know. Right. Of course, but, I mean... Fourth of, of July, he, we try to recreate them with fireworks, right. you know. <laughs> yeah, but of course, you know, the devil makes a good case because he is, he is smart, and uh, you know, um, the um, the characters. Howie says it's a pretty useless degree, astronomy, and uh, 
And Josh says, uh, you know, uh, 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 mentioning a degree in optical astronomy is a real conversation stopper. You know, these, uh, <laughs> yeah, and none of them became astronomers. So, you know, the, to give the devil his due, he's, you know, he's saying, you guys um, were doing something utterly pointless and trying to claim that it was important. And, uh, and uh, you know, that, that's an argument that, that he makes. And while I disagree with it, I, get, I give him full reign to, to make it and give, and give instances. Um, so, you also have a lot of humor in the stories. There are yes. a lot, I mean, there's just fun moments, and there is a lot of humor. Yes, <laughs> there, there, you know, Catholic jokes. <laughs> Catholic jokes, yes. You know, and when I say Catholic joke, I don't mean anything having having to do with nuns or parochial school or anything <laughs> having to do with venal or corrupt clergy. None of that is in here. Um, there are jokes like. Uh, a 12-year-old is thinking, what happens if I go up for communion and I drop the Eucharist? I fumble the wafer. You know, is this really bad luck? You know, <laughs> what, 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 you know. Um, or as I mentioned before, um, what if you get talked into getting a really terrible saint's name? What if it's Aloysius, you know? <laughs> um, and you're stuck with it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there's there's a lot of talk through the through the book about uh, which saints to pray to, um, and uh, you can't have too many. So um, and there's an instance where um, where somebody says um, you know the the candles um, are supposed to be left there to warm up uh, Mary's outstretched hands, um, but the <laughs> so. Um, so there are there are some gentle jokes about about uh, the Catholic world from cradle Catholics, um, and hopefully no no one will take them as being being um, sacrilegious or irreligious. Um, but just uh, the way twelve year olds think about uh, about uh, the the religious world in which they they've grown up. Um, Absolutely. Which I you yourself are a recent Catholic. Uh, recent right, I am. I am. I am a recent convert to Catholicism, but I've uh, been involved in you know, on a spiritual journey my entire life, and um, I was raised Episcopalian and um, studied Dante um, in in college among other things, and then I went to Italy, where I baffled people by speaking archaic Italian. Um, <laughs> And uh, when I was in Florence, I lived in Florence, Italy, and I was wow. deeply moved by, uh, by Renaissance religious art. And I came back uh, to the States and I started singing, uh, singing masses and choral groups. And, uh, and all these were profound experiences. But I was kind of waiting for, you know, that um, convincing argument or that, that knock you off the horse miracle to say, you know, you belong in the church, not, you know, not on the periphery going to going to mass and hearing the homilies and singing the songs and and feeling like this is wonderful and I and I I'm moved by it. Um, but uh, I had to get off the bench and into the game. And <laughs> I realized that uh, that it was folly to wait around for the convincing argument or the or the miracle that those things weren't going to happen and I shouldn't expect them. And it was pride to, to, to even imagine that that was, that was the route to get, to get there. You know, and uh, uh, one of the things our, our priest said, which I found very, very telling, is uh, get on the train. We can figure these other things out later. Just get on the train. Yeah, don't and, miss the boat. <laughs> right. And... Um, you know, this is the better I, boat. <laughs> yes, right, right, and uh, yeah, and the better well, boat you know, is, is a vehicle for for a kind of spiritual and moral transformation. Um, it's not. I just think sometimes the miracles come, but we 
we don't necessarily see them easily. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful movie um, called The Third Miracle. I don't know mm -hmm. if you've ever seen it. No. Um, highly recommend it. If anyone out there is listening, that's listening here has not seen The Third Miracle, I'm trying to remember the name of the actor. It's a well-known actor. Um, but he's sent to, he's a, he's a priest in Rome and he's losing his faith and he's sent to some little town in Timbuktu to um, check out a mirror, you know, a, a supposed um, a statue that's doing something bleeding or crying or something. And he's supposed to check out this, this uh, thing that's going on, this miracle. And he's, um, I guess he's sort of charged with looking for three miracles associated with a particular saint yep. there. Yep. So he finds two miracles and in his faith, he's ready to leave the church. He's ready to leave the priesthood. He's quite miserable. And um, so he goes and he spends some time in this little village and he confirms one miracle and then he confirms a second one. Um, and his life is just totally changed by being there um, and his mm -hmm. strength, you know, faith right. is strengthened and he goes back to Rome, um, a good priest, a solid priest. Um, but he goes back to Rome and he says, you know, I don't think the whole thing, th this guy's a saint because there were only two miracles. I couldn't come up with a third. And he was the third. <laughs> right. Yeah, he yes. never saw the third miracle. Right, right. It's yep. a wonderful, highly recommended, wonderful film. Wonderful right. Film, the third miracle. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we don't realize well, I, we don't hear the miracle. <laughs> right. I, it's, it's interesting that I uh, a novel I wrote before I wrote these two books involves... Um, someone who feels like they have experienced a personal miracle um, and, uh, and uh, a rather showy one. Um, he's, uh, his life is saved by an immense flock of birds and, um, and he spends much of the story trying to figure out why God saved him and what he's, what he's supposed to do. And uh, eventually he, he figures that out. So yes, uh, there are miracles out there. Um, I, I had one around, uh, around the death of my father. Um, my father was a scientist and uh, an engineer and not a religious man. Um, um, and after he died, um, um, you know, I was very torn up and, uh, and I had a lucid dream. And the lucid dream, my father appeared to me and he said to me, it's only a change of state. And I knew exactly what he meant. Solid to liquid to gas, body to spirit. And that the transition, you know, of, of, of death to new life is, is not a big deal. It's just a change of state. Um, Eventually yeah. back to solid because we get our resurrection of the body yeah. and yes. it better not be exactly this one. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. I, I want an upgrade. <laughs> I want an upgrade. Yes, exactly. <laughs> right. See, we're making Catholic God. jokes. Upgrade. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So is is um one of the things also I wanted to ask you was about there's some quite a bit of technical detail in both stories. Right. Right. Well, I I was for many years a technical writer in computers, and ah. uh, I wrote uh, I wrote uh, fiction and did storytelling on the side, if you will. And they're completely different um, realms. Um, technical writing you is you know clarity and succinctness and a very restricted vocabulary, um, and you know checking out checking everything and removing all possible ambiguity is what to do. And fiction, very much different. Um, um, but, uh, you know, I've, I've all my life been interested in, in technical subjects, in science, in, in astronomy, um, in, um, um, and I'm not an astronomer, and I'm not a proficient sailor. Um, and, anyone, and you're not an art forger. <laughs> no. Well, that's true. Not that either. Um, um, but um, um, one of the things that, uh, that is true about fiction, and this is, you know, for any of the aspiring fiction writers out there, 
the one determinant of of readers' um, uh, affection for for fictional works, um, the only one, somebody did this big survey, is that it introduces factual information that is unfamiliar to the reader. An exotic location, um, a a technical topic, um, um, you know, a a, a unique uh, lifestyle or, or whatever. Um, that's what uh, what readers are seeking in fiction, um, and you know, hopefully they get a lot more than that. But right. it's there, um, and um, these topics interested me. Um, but these books are not about astronomy or sailing, and they can be read and appreciated by someone who knows nothing about either topic. Um, that was not, me. <laughs> They're, they're not tutorials um, <laughs> by any means. Um, and, uh, you know, The Better Boat, for example, is a 12-year-old who knows nothing about sailing. And much of the humor in it is how much he doesn't know about sailing and how many, how many uh, mistakes he makes and how many, how many terms he doesn't know and all of this. And, uh, and it was no nice as a reader, I got, I got to learn right along with him. Yes. Which, was, which was right. nice, was fun, right. um, ideas and, and concepts and terms that I was totally unfamiliar with. Right. And, you know, I'm, I certainly hope that, that these uh, stories are not top-heavy with, with that kind of information, because that's not what they're about. They're about yeah. people. They're about, they're about moral choices. They're about goodness, kindness. They're about... Uh, about sustaining relationships and uh, and uh, and try and under trial, they're about sacrifice, um, and uh, you know that's that's what matters. Not not how much you know about boats or how much I know about boats or telescopes. You know, um, so C.S. Lewis said we. I believe it was C.S. Lewis said we read to know we are not alone. Yes. Absolutely, and, absolutely. And, and you, might, uh, um, you know, your your situation may not be the telescope or the boat, but we all have times where you know we come together in friendship um, mm-hmm. to solve a problem, right? Um, to figure out what's the right thing to do, um, mm-hmm. what's the what's the wrong thing that we shouldn't do, um, and then right. sometimes we need help um, from mm-hmm. our friends figuring out right. what that is. Right, and we grow through our choices, good choices, bad choices. And, you know, if it's, if the, the kind of fiction that I write and prefer, um, we come out the, the other end, and at the end of the observatory, it ends at a birthday party. And what, what more could we want in life than have our story ending with a birthday party where everybody that you care about is there? Amen. Yeah. So, so you're, you know, usually we, you know, we, the old saying, you can't judge a book by its cover, but mm-hmm. in this case, yes. you can, mm-hmm. <laughs> your, your, your um, book has a beautiful, exceptionally beautiful cover. Yes. And I know you had help with this cover. I, I had a lot of help with this cover. This is, is a photograph. Is the family around by any chance? Um, I don't know if she's coming down or not, but this is a photograph that was taken by my wife, Deborah. Um, it may not look like a photograph, but it is. Um, it, and there's a moon, um, which is actually a, a image of a moon that we have here. It's a lamp. And there's a, a, a paper sailboat, folded sailboat, which I folded. And then there's um, some painted waves. And, um, and these all figure in it. The full moon, of course, is in the observatory. Um, and the the origami sailboat is a is a key part of uh, of the better boat, and uh, and so um, and I, it's, it's absolutely it just, it's an absolutely beautiful cover. I hope Deborah right? can sneak yes. down from somewhere and stick her head in here and say hello. Yes, um, and the, uh, she the part of it that was completely completely a gift um, was um, the the shadow of the sailboat, yeah. um, which. Uh, was you know we knit, we didn't 
predict that. We didn't expect it, and it showed up. Um, it's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And it's a be two beautiful stories. Highly, I love them. Highly recommend them. Um, the book is available through Enroute and on Amazon. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yes, that is correct. It's in both paperback and Kindle form on Amazon. And uh, um, go on to Amazon and read the sample. The sample is of the observatory. Uh, the Kindle one is slightly longer, um, which is something I just found out. Um, and uh, see what you think. You know, see if uh, see if there's there's something there that that keeps you going. Um, just, uh, They're uh, both delightful, and thank I thank you. you, thank you, thank it's you. Really delightful. What are you working on next? Well, um, the, the, pike. <laughs> the thing I'm writing right now is something called Mr. Coe's Garden, which is about a, a very old man who hires a teenager to help him turn his backyard into a garden a huge garden. And uh, the teenager Curtis is, you know, kind of a clueless um, 21st century kid. Um, but he likes Mr. Co because Mr. Co is, is quirky and funny and uses language in ways that, that he's never seen before. And Mr. Co keeps mentioning, um, we're making this garden for Mrs. Co. And Curtis has never seen Mrs. Coe and doesn't even know if she exists. Um, so he's, he's fascinated by, by this mystery of making the garden for Mrs. Coe. And uh, it's a story about, um, about love and marriage. It's a story about uh, coming to understanding. It's a, it's a story that certainly touches on death um, as any story about ex ex um, really old people um, kind of has to, and an acceptance of death, and even a beauty in death, a garden. Um, so that's that's what I'm working on now. That sounds exciting. And that here's here's the uh, the design yeah, of the book cover. <laughs> um, and she just wants to come in and say hello. Not really. This is I this is my Libby. <laughs> this is Deborah. <laughs> Hi, Deborah. Good morning, Kiki. Good morning. Do I look at Do I yeah, look at you, Kiki? You look at the camera. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, bookworm Good morning. family. Right, right. Deborah, Deborah is my Livy. Um, Mark Twain um, had a wife named Olivia Libby, and uh, he would put things in his books in order for Livy to take them out and say, "Mark, you can't say that." So <laughs> this is my best reader and my Livy. <laughs> Right. Oh, I'm welcome. constantly saying no, no. no. <laughs> and she's always right. <laughs> she's always right. <laughs> so good morning. Oh, you. you have a good talk. We did. We had a wonderful yeah. talk. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks for joining us. You did a beautiful job together on the cover. Um, oh, so thank, thank, you. thank you. One more time. Thank you. You can't there. judge a book yeah. by its cover, yeah. but in this case, you so can. Much. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it's really beautiful. Nice sure. job, both of you. To my dad, too. Yep. Yeah, the that. better boat is dedicated to. It's dedicated to my father, right? And, to Donald Laporte, um, right. lifelong sailor. And mm -hmm. when he was dying, Glenn started writing stories for me in the morning to console me. And I would say, "Please keep writing. I need that. Please right. keep writing." And then it evolved into something different. Right. Right. But, well, I'm very excited by what it evolved into. Thank you, both thank of you. us. Thank you. We uh, we watch sailboats out our window, and that's yeah. as close as we get to them most of the time. But uh, we certainly certainly love to see them out there. And, uh, Since we've got okay, you here, yes. Deborah, Isn't you want to end us with a little prayer? What? Oh, me? Yeah. yeah oh, <laughs> Lord, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for this group. Thank you for the conversations that take place here. We pray that they touch people's hearts. And in Jesus' name we pray. Thank you. And thank you for healing my hip last night. <laughs> Woke up with a, a hip that's been horribly mm -hmm. bothering yes. me and no pain today. So thank Amen. you. Yay. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, again, the name of the book, Things Beloved. Things yeah. Beloved. Yes. Yay, and I look forward love. to seeing you. Glad I hope you love it. <laughs> with the next book and um, 
God bless. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.